Well, good morning. Uh, this morning at communion, we have a fun treat. Uh, Marsha Martin was an associate pastor here for eight years or so, and Marsha's in the house. And we asked if she would help with communion today, uh, and she has graciously said yes, and so that's a real treat for all of us. So welcome back, Marsha and Jim, her husband, sitting beside her. Very fun to have you both here today. Let's pray as we open up the scriptures. Lord Jesus, I pray your blessing on us, that you'd guide us and lead us. You'd open the scriptures, push back what is dark in our own minds and hearts, and, or, or in this room, or in this state, whatever is dark that would turn our minds from you to worry, or from you to anxiety or anger. Lord, fill us instead with peace and joy, and speak your word into our hearts. Be real to us, Lord Jesus, as you are real. You are not an idea. You are Lord of heaven and earth. You are Lord of this room and Lord of the lives that fill it. So come, Lord Jesus, by the power of your spirit and touch us, illumine us, set our hearts on fire for you, and, and help us to understand what grace is in your precious name. Amen. Well, we're walking through this study on Galatians. This is the fourth message, I think, and we, we're halfway through chapter 2. And uh, I've changed the title on this, and we're working not only on Galatians, but looking at how we weave it together with the Protestant Reformation, because the 500th anniversary of the Reformation is at the end of this month, and we'll weave that together a little more as we go along. But today, I changed the name of this one to Clearing the Ledger, instead of whatever you have on the front of your bulletin. I usually come up with the titles and the rough plan four to six months in advance, and when I actually get down to the week that I'm preparing, I go, what was I thinking? Or I don't like that anymore, or whatever it might be, or just a better idea. And I like this one better, clearing the ledger. Uh, how do you clear the ledger? How do you clear your account when you have a debt? The usual answer, of course, is you, you pay it off yourself. You're responsible. You have a debt, you have to pay it off. It's on your shoulders. It's up to you. Uh, but it... In the Christian sense, it doesn't work quite that easily. But let me tell you about something I just learned of, and this is fascinating. You know, the United States government has three funds. The U.S. Treasury Department has three gift funds that people can contribute to, should you so desire. This is above and beyond taxes. If you desire that you would like to give a, to a gift to the government freely, they have three separate funds to receive that. And one of them is absolutely fascinating. It was founded a little over 200 years ago in 1811 when James Madison was president. And it was while he was president that the Treasury Department received an anonymous letter and $5. And in the letter it said, I defrauded the government $5 and I feel guilty and I'm paying it back. And so they sent that in. And they didn't know what to do with that exactly, but what they did, they established in 1811 the conscience fund and it actually exists to this day there is the conscience fund and it exists and you could see in, in uh, New York Times article August 5th 1884 ran an article on the conscience fund they actually had a date uh, that's wrong about the date of when it was established but it's not the first or last time the New York Times will be wrong uh, in 1913 an actual film was made about the conscience fund and uh, talking about, it was, a, it was a, a silent movie, two reels, so it was considered a fairly long movie, of, and of a guy who, who found the right way with, through the help of the conscience fund. And mistakes he'd made in his life, he was able to, to, to make things right again. So there's some interesting things. It started small with that $5. The estimates are that $10 million have passed through this fund in the years that have been around it. Uh, some of the gifts were very small. The smallest gifts, the smallest donation to this fund was nine cents. And again, anonymous letter someone sent in saying that he felt guilty that he had used the same three cent stamp three times without paying for it. And he wanted to make amends. And he sent nine cents to the Treasury Department. There was a, a mysterious one. In 1990, a check was received with no note letter or explanation for $155,502 to the conscience fund. There was one where a man said this, about eight years ago, 
I took from a railroad station an item worth $25. This has been on my conscience since. So I am closing $50 to clear my conscience. Another person sent in a dime that he'd found while walking along the street and sent it into the conscience fund for whatever reason. There's one person who, in an anonymous note, uh, said that I can't afford what I owe in one lump sum, so I'll send it in installments, and for several years sent $35 regular payments to the conscience fund. Now, the strangest, or perhaps most uh, delightful, enjoyable one, letter that came in, again, anonymous, but it said this, Dear Internal Revenue Service, I have not been able to sleep at night because I cheated on last year's income tax. Enclosed, find a cashier's check for $1,000. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the balance. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny, huh? So, you know, what you have here is an interesting way of people are trying to, to solve their guilt. It's, it's a way to, to get the conscience clear. Uh, clear the ledger, so to speak, with the government. What is intriguing, if you look at some of the facts of this fund, in 1987, it had, uh, it had five, $5, million, seven hundred thousand dollars had passed through the account, roughly, uh, by 1987. Contributions following, in 2014, $1.1 million came into the fund in that one year. In 2015, it dropped significantly, less than half came in. In 2016, less than a tenth of that came in. And to date, the year is not finished, but to date in 2017, they have received 1,600. So that says that one of three things is happening. Either people are doing less things for which they are guilty than they used to, or they're doing just as many wrong things, they're just not feeling as guilty about it as they used to, or they are less and less confident that the government is the place to find atonement. You can take your choice. And I would want to add, on behalf of our church and our finance team, that should you feel guilty and want to make a contribution, we are happy to receive it. And it can be anonymous. But I would still say you need to take it up with Jesus. <laughs> well, we're looking at Galatians. You know, when we talk about Galatians, we talk about this. And, and what we're coming to today is a passage that's kind of talking about how do you clear the ledger of your life? How do you set things straight? You know, we've all made mistakes, haven't we? I mean, we know it. You don't have to look very far in our lives. There's things in our lives, every one of us, that we wish we hadn't done. Sometimes they're just tiny. You say that cruel word, and I go, I wish I hadn't said that that snide comment, or sometimes it's bigger. I, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't made that decision that I made those years ago. And, and look what it's cost. I wish I hadn't done it. We have regret. We have guilt. We have shame. And how do we clear the ledger? And it's one thing, you know, if, if it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship, you know, if, if you have a friend or something like that, Marsh and I or Jim you know, or Bruce, you know, and I, if I did something wrong to one of them, you, you know, clearing the slate, it can be kind of hard. Uh, but it's not hard in another sense because you just talk. You know, Marsha, I'm sorry. You know, I, I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I hurt you. You, you clear the slate. You, you, you bring it up. You, you lay it out. But when you enlarge that and you think about a life that's wrong or, or being in front of God and, and being wrong before him, how, how do we know that the ledger's clean between me and God, you and God, that the slate's covered? that the debt's been paid for. How do we know that? And a whole lot of the Bible is about that very question. What do you do to clear the slate? How, what do you do to make sure that you're right before God? And that's what we're going to look at today. The reality is to get the slate clean, there's several different ways to, to do that. There's different ways that we commonly take on to try and make it happen to clean the slate, to, to bring the balance back, uh, deal with our guilt. The first is simple, and it's just uh, denial. We just deny that we're that bad, uh, that what we did wasn't that big a deal. Everybody does it. Nobody was hurt. 
And whatever it might be, we might point to other people and say, well, I'm not nearly as bad as she is, or I don't do nearly as many weird things as he does. And whatever it is, we deny that our problem, our guilt, our, the, the, what we have on the ledger page might be significantly bad. We just deny it. But when you're dealing with these things, when you're trying to pay these debts off, there's always a cost, always a cost. And when we use denial to pay the debt, so to speak, we just act like it doesn't happen, the cost is our mental health. Because we know we've done something wrong. We know inside of us that there's stuff that's wrong, it's broken. We know we've hurt others, it's not been covered. We know that we've done things that God's not wanted us to do. It's not been covered, or we're, we're a whole, Noah's sitting there. And, and to act like it doesn't exist, to, to push conscience down, and just to deny, will lead to mental health problems. Guilt and anguish, depression, different things bubble up. So another way that people deal with it commonly, not any more healthily, but it's evasion. And with evasion, that's the idea of just acting like it didn't even exist. Or saying, I know what happened. I know I did it. I cheated on the income tax, or I lied to so-and-so, or committed adultery, whatever it might be. But nobody knows. And as long as nobody knows, it's okay. But the thing that that will cost you is your integrity. You can't live that way and have integrity, and it'll cost your integrity. Now, the third way is what we're going to spend the bulk of our time about looking at, and it's looking at the idea of how do you clear the ledger before God? How can you know that the ledger, that your life, what you owe God, so to speak, is down to zero? And the stamp in red ink across the top says, paid in full. How do you know that that's happened? Well, the way that it usually works is that in religious the world, in the religious world, is that you pay it down by doing something, by, by working in such a way, living in such a way, practicing a way of life that pays God back what you owe, that makes your life atoned for, paid for, the debt relief, relieved. And, and this, we will see when we get into Galatians in, in today's passage, Paul is going to take a passionate, vehement stand against any concept of that. And it's vitally important because, you know, every religion in the world, every single one, you can check them out. They have different flavors, of course, different perspectives. But every single one, even the Christian religion, when it's become a religion and not a relationship, believes that what your job is, your task, your mandate, your responsibility is, is to do what God wants you to do. Do the practices and the rituals and the rules so that he will reward you and your, your debt will be cleared. You have to pay off the debt. And we'll see in Galatians today that Paul is absolutely against this because the Christian faith, when it's done right, when it's proclaimed right, when it's taught right, when it's lived right, is actually against that in every way, shape, and form. The Christian faith, in, in when it's real and true and, and rightly spoken, will say that there's nothing you can do to pay that debt. There's nothing you can do. It has to be paid by another. Now, the passage today in Galatians, it's truly one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. It's just an absolute amazing passage. The last third of it, that the front two-thirds of it are a little esoteric. They're a little weird and strange. And if you don't know much about the story, or maybe you don't know much about the Bible... It, it might be hard to understand what the heck is Paul talking about here and why does it matter? But as we've walked through Galatians, we've seen that Paul has been using a lot of his own personal story. Paul talks about how he was, not just in Galatians, but in other letters, he talks about how he was a Pharisee. He was a, a Jewish man with uncommon passion for his faith, for Judaism. And not just the faith of it, but the rules, the rituals, the regulations. He was zealous it says in Galatians that he was blazing ahead of all his contemporaries, being extraordinarily zealous for the traditions of the fathers, he said. In the book of Philippians, his letter to, to the Philippians, he says that as far as the law was concerned, that is the Ten Commandments and all the Jewish laws, as far as they were concerned, he says, I was blameless. Can you imagine saying that? that you, are, you have followed the Ten Commandments, you followed the laws, the requirements, everything that's required of you in in Judaism, you follow them so perfectly and so well that you are blameless. But the problem for Paul was, 
was that he had an encounter with Jesus. He, he hated Christians. He hated Christians, and he hated the concept of Jesus. But on the Damascus Road, Jesus met him face to face in a blinding light, literally knocked him down to the dust and blinded him for three days. But it was an encounter with Jesus. And what Paul understood is that everything he believed and everything he thought previously, his whole life, it was wrong. Everything was wrong. All the religious practices he'd been doing were folly, foolish, idiocy. They would got him nothing. And all they did was led to a mindset that he was able to pay off the debt that he had before God. That he didn't have much debt. And whatever that was there, he was able to pay it off himself. And it was his encounter with Jesus that changed everything. But when Paul encountered Jesus, see, Jesus gave him a message. Paul says in Galatians earlier, that we saw, he says, I didn't go to Bible school to learn about this. I didn't sit down in a pastor's Bible study to learn about the gospel. Jesus met me face to face and he told me what the, the truth is. He confronted me. He challenged me. He gave it to me. And so the first chapter of Galatians, Paul says, yeah, I didn't go up to Jerusalem to the head office, to the mother church and check in that whether I was doing it right or had the right message or the right understanding. Jesus gave me the right understanding. I didn't need anybody's approval. And I didn't need anybody to add to my message. I knew who Jesus was. I knew what he had done to me and what he'd done for me. So Paul, in that first chapter, he says, I didn't go up to Jerusalem. And I went up a little later, or just two weeks. And then he says, a couple of years later, a couple of years passed, and I went back to have a conference with those who were, who were apostles at the church, leaders of the church. And he says, I told them what I'd done, how my message, what I'm proclaiming amongst the Gentiles to non-Jews. And he says, they not only approved of it, they commended me. They, they shook hands on it, as they say. They extended the fellowship and said, you go to the Gentiles. You are doing the right thing. We affirm your message. We will go to the Jews and you go to the Gentiles. And that's how chapter 1 ended, or chapter, the first part of chapter 2. So we come to today's passage. Peter, who's also named Cephas in Aramaic, Cephas and James and John had approved of Paul's ministry. And that's where we ended. So listen now to chapter 2, verse 11, Galatians. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face because he stood clearly in the wrong. Until certain people had come from James... He had been eating together with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he stopped doing this. And he separated himself because he was afraid of those who were with the pro-circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews, they also joined him in this hypocrisy. So that even Barnabas was led astray by them in their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not behaving in a way that was consistent with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, right in front of them all, if you, live like, who being a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how is it that you try to force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that no one is justified by works of the law, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by the faithfulness of Christ, and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified, set right in God's eyes. But, if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found to be sinners, is Christ then the one that encourages sin? Absolutely not. But if I try to build up again that which I had destroyed, I demonstrate that I am a person who's a lawbreaker. God's law. For through the law, I died to the law in order that I might live to God. I have been crucified together with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. So the life I now live in this body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God, 
who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside God's grace because if righteousness could come through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. It is a good word. It's hard to understand. There's a lot of subjects and issues and topics that are very mysterious in this passage. Well, Peter being doing the wrong thing and Paul confronting him. These strange lines of through the law, I died to the law. And what does all that mean? Let, let me try to illustrate it if I can. Let's picture you all are the church of Galatia. This is the body that's gathered together. And in this church of Galatia, that you who are sitting in these nice chairs right here, you come out of Judaism. That's right. Sit up a little straighter, a little prouder. That's right. I like that. I like that. And, and, and the rest of you come out of the Gentile world. You didn't grow up Jewish. You know, for the most part, most of you know very little about Judaism. Some of you know something and are impressed by it, like it. Most of you know little and are not impressed with it. But you, you grew up in it. You were raised with the law. And in reality, you are a different group than they are, right? You are a very different group. That's right. You are a very different group. Because the reality was the Jewish world was a fantastically more moral world than the, than the pagan world, the Gentile world. In the Gentile world, they were, they were, the, the sins were just crazy and wild and rampant and diverse. Anybody could choose whatever religion they wanted. Anybody could choose whatever God they wanted. Everybody could choose whatever ethic they wanted. And it was pretty much anything goes as long as you don't disrupt somebody else. And it was a free-for-all. But Judah, the Jews were not like that, were we? We live different. We may not have done it perfect, but the Ten Commandments mattered to us. And there was, a, there was a righteousness in Israel, unlike anywhere else in the world. And we're proud of that. We like that. We believe that matters. And this is what Paul's addressing, because you see this group of people who are really out of the Jewish faith, kind of like us. They'd grown up in Judaism. They'd learned all the rituals. And as Jews, now they're Christian Jews. They'd accepted Jesus. They look out at the pagan world and they go, this, this is an evil world. They're, the, the sins are rampant. They're crazy. They chase after every statue and fall down in front of it and worship. Their morals are as bad as you can imagine. And so they said, what we need to know is when you preach Jesus, Mike, if you go out and preach Jesus, you better make sure you tell them to follow the law. It's Jesus doesn't get them off the hook of following the law. You don't want to use Jesus and the gospel and turn Jesus into someone who actually is an agent of sin. And what he means by that is if Mike or Paul or I were going around and preaching Jesus with such passion and such claim that it's grace, it's grace, it's grace, and all you need is him, this group that came out of Judaism is thinking, well, if you don't give them some rules and some regulations, if you don't give them the law, then they're still going to be running their crazy, wild lives. You have to give them some rules. Otherwise, they're not going to be good Christians. But Paul says, if you think that they need rules and religion and rituals to get right with God, in addition to Jesus, you're going to wreck the gospel. It was a huge battle of what is the gospel. Is it Jesus alone or Jesus and rules and rituals, regulations, things that you would do that would shape your life. And this battle continues to the very present. In the religious world, there are some that would heap all kinds of burdens, rules and regulations, and that you're not really a good Christian, no matter what you believe about Jesus, you're not really a good Christian if you're not doing certain things, living a certain way, practicing certain things. And so Paul had this battle and we have this, this divided church. And so we believe this, it is such a great thing that we grew up in this, isn't it? We grew up in this Jewish faith. We're so grateful for it. And they need to know this. They need to know these rules because if they don't know them, they're just going to run rampant. There won't be any morals. Well, Paul's going to address that question in chapter four, 5 and 6. But right here, he's addressing something very different. And it's that question, how do we get the ledger clean? How, how is it that the ledger between us and God can be straightened out, can be cleansed, that we know that it's clear that that paid stamp is on there? How do we know? And for Paul, it's not based on what we do, but on what's been done for us. 
Because the simple fact of the matter is, is you can never do enough to clear the slate. The debt that each of us owes to God can, is so vast, so huge, that it can never be cleared by anything that we do. Someone else has to pay it. Someone else has to cover it for us. So Paul says this. You and I, speaking to the Jewish people in the, in the Galatian church, he says we're by nature Jews, right? Not Gentile sinners. He acknowledges that they are a rough and rowdy crowd. They come out of a rough background, and we're not like that, right? But notice what he says. Yet we... We, we know that a person doesn't stand right in God's eyes by doing works of the laws. That's why we're Christians. We accepted sometime in the past, we Jewish believers, that the law and the rules are not enough to get us right in front of God. And we embraced Jesus. We believed in Jesus because we concluded that the law was incapable of fulfilling our spiritual needs, of getting us right before God. So Paul's using that against them. If, so if that's the case, if you acknowledged in your lives that the law is incapable of making you right before God, following the commandments is incapable of making you right for God, and thus you went to Jesus, why, good believers, are you going back to the law? Why on earth would you imagine that the law has been set aside so that you can embrace Jesus, and now you have to perfect that embrace of Jesus by following rules that you previously set aside? It's ludicrous. He says, we've learned, it's so powerfully, repeatedly stated in this, we know that no one is set right in God's sight. No one is justified by works of the law, doing what's demanded, but by simply believing in Christ, by his righteousness. So we've been made right with God because our faith in Christ, not because we've obeyed the law. For no one will ever be right in God's eyes by obeying the law. And he continues a little bit later. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. This is the answer that he's got. The answer that comes to how it clears everything up. That it's not by doing the things that the law requires that sets us right, but by having another who's done it for us in a way that we never could. As I said, that we can't do what's required of us. Sin has broken us. It's weakened us. We don't even desire, really, to do all the right things. And what we need is somebody to do it for us and then to have his account applied to ours. And to Paul, this is what the gospel is all about. It's not Jesus and then you doing laws and rules and rituals on top of that. And if you do both, you have Jesus and the right lifestyle, then God will be pleased with you. It's Jesus alone. And the reason is because of what Jesus has done for us. Done for Paul. And done for you. Look at this passage. It's one of the absolute best, richest, most beautiful passages in the New Testament. I have been crucified. And just before it, it says, Through the law... I died to the law in order that I might live for God. I mean, isn't that the goal of our lives? I mean, why do you come here? Why come to church? Why sing the songs? Why give up a Sunday morning? The purpose is for something really deep. That we would walk with God. That we would know him. We would know, be known by him in deeper ways. We'd understand who he is and what he's doing. And we'd learn that together, gathering together and wrestling together as family. And what it means to walk with God. I, he says, through the law, I died to the law. I, the, all the law demanded of me. All the law decreed of me that I have failed, that I have fallen, that I have blown it. Left, right, and center. All that the law has said of my failure and what is expected of me and how little I've done to pull that off. The law kills me. It declares that the only thing that I am worthy of is a sentence of death. And I can never get out of that. No matter how moral or nice I am. And he says, well, thank God there's been a death. I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And this life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Luther said that we have to take this for me and grasp it with both hands. That he loved me and gave himself for me. Each of us needs to say that he loved me. It's not just Billy Graham and it's not just Mother Teresa. He loves you. He gave himself for you. 
he loved you. That all that the law demanded and all that was expected of us, all the failings, the huge debt we had on our ledger page, he looked at that. And instead of wrath or anger, he looked at it with mercy and grace and love, and he paid the price. He paid the death in our place. And so it's an astonishing word. It's an astonishing concept. One word in Greek, crucified together with Christ. It's or with not Christ, but crucified together with is one word in Greek. It's, it's something happened on that cross in which his death becomes mine. That everything that's wrong inside me is somehow put on that cross where it's accounted to him. It's put on his ledger. Where everything that's righteous and good about him is put on my ledger. And it, an eternal, mysterious exchange has taken place. And I have died to the law. It no longer controls me. It no longer condemns me. I've been crucified together with Christ, and it's no longer I who live. But this life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God is one way to put it. Or by the faithfulness of the Son of God is maybe a better way to put it. Who loved me and gave himself for me. By putting it that way, which is the right, I think, right way to read the Greek, the faithfulness of the Son of God is it's not even your faith. It's not even your responsiveness. It's his faith, his faithfulness, his love, his perfection falls upon us as a free gift. And we live in that. We receive it and live in it and bask in it and are changed by it. So we don't set aside God's grace. We don't set it aside and replace it with a bunch of laws and rules and regulations. Because if you could win God's salvation by doing them, then Jesus died for nothing. It was lunacy to have him die if all you needed to do is follow the Ten Commandments better. But because we can't, he died on our behalf and we died with him. This is what Paul is fighting for, and what we need to grasp to this day is that there's a gospel, and there's pseudo-gospels. A pseudo-gospel is anyone that comes along and says, God loves you, Jesus loves you, he's given you a gift, but you have to do certain things or you don't get it. You have to act a certain way, live a certain way. What we have to understand is the life that Jesus gives us is an absolute gift, that you can't earn it, you can't deserve it. You didn't even want it. You weren't seeking after it. Before you loved him, he loved you. And he gave his son. This is what it says in 1 John. It's an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's John's way of saying, I've been crucified together with him. And so Paul is trying to tell the Galatian church, all of us, the Jewish us that are in that little, the little bit, to, and, and the Gentiles that, you know, when you hear the message of who Jesus is, you recognize that we're all sinful. That you really can't any longer just say Gentile sinners. Because when you understand the gospel and our inability to do what God requires of us, we're all in it together. We're all equally broken, equally lost, equally godless. Us in this room and everybody outside of this room, we're equally lost. But thanks be to God who looked on our lostness, not with rage and wrath, but with tenderness and mercy and gave his son to pay the price and calls for us to simply believe in him. To be a Christian means simply to say, Jesus, I, I've tried to run my life without you. I've tried to think that my morality, my ethics, my rules would be able to be sufficient to make myself, my life right in your eyes. And I'm sorry for that. And I ask you to take my life, to be Lord over my life, to run my life. I give you my life, Lord Jesus. And that's the Christian life. And everything, all the ethics that come flow out of that as an act of gratitude. Not as a way to earn his favor, but as a response. A gracious, joyous response that we already have his favor. And how might we show our gratitude, Lord? Well, by righteous living. But we don't do that to earn it. We do it to enjoy what he's given. It's a message of grace. And it's a word that says he loved you and gave himself for you and that truth should be grasped with both hands and never let go let's pray lord thank you for how much you love us thank you for your grace your loving kindness we pray that you'd fall upon us in fresh ways to understand what you've done for us and on our behalf lord open our eyes to the truth of who you are and that we might understand your gifts and your grace better thank you lord jesus we love you and we pray in your precious name amen